My conversation today is with brothers Jason Richards, John Rourke, and Joe Martinez, joint co-hosts along with brother Robert Johnson of the Masonic Roundtable podcast. Formed in 2014, the Masonic Roundtable is a podcast covering a broad array of topics throughout Freemasonry, featuring a weekly panel of hosts comprised of Masonic brethren from all over the United States. Brothers Jason, John, and Joe are also hosting Esotericon, a Masonic conference focusing on esotericism in Manassas, Virginia on June 15th of this year. We sat down to talk about the past, present, and future of the craft, current trends in esotericism, and general occulture. This conversation is one I had been waiting to have for a long time. I'm Ike Baker, and this is the Arcanum Podcast. started man. so i'm i'm very 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 pleased to have with me here today uh brothers joe martinez john rourke and jason richards of the masonic roundtable podcast i feel like we're at a high water mark on this podcast right now this season so far is 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 great and i'm i really am honored you know uh brother jason you reached out to me on uh on social media and you'd been kind of following along with some stuff that I, that I've been doing with, with, I think Mark Stavish and Jamie Lamb. And from there, uh, I was just overjoyed to see that, um, you know, brothers Joe and John got, uh, involved as well. I'm very happy to have you guys here today. Um, so thanks. I think it's gonna be great. The first thing that I want to kind of talk about, right? Because as I was kind of explaining to you guys before, I've got a good mix of people that listen to the podcast that are Masonic brethren. I've got a uh, an equally sort of distributed demographic that's just in the general occult world. So for those people that might not be familiar with the Masonic Roundtable podcast, who will volunteer an answer on how it started? How'd that how'd that get going? And and at its core, what do you think it is? What are, what what's the telos behind it? Yeah. So yeah, it's uh it was my brainchild. Um, but you know, it it was a, a team effort shortly thereafter uh so yeah i was a worshipful master of my lodge john ruark and um i was worshipful master of my lodge in 2013 and the theme of my year was all about masonic education pulled in some great speakers um was replaced by my successor and then had kind of like an empty nest syndrome i was like well now what do i do <laughs> like because i had done all this hard work to bring a lot of good educational topics to inspire the brothers of the lodge and now I'm, I'm just kind of put aside. So I needed to give myself something to do. And about that same time I was watching other uh, video podcasts kind of get started in the YouTube world uh, where other Masonic podcasts existed uh, previous to the Masonic round table. They were much more one directional. And so I wanted to have the conversation that we have after lodge when we really get excited about an educational topic, I wanted to recreate that and, and bring in some, some good chemistry from, from other brothers of like mind. So in February of 2014, I ran an experiment and a decade later, we're still, we're still running that experiment. So um, we're, we're nobody special. We're just a bunch of brothers who love to talk about all the weird stuff. And we and we also said back in February 2014 when we kicked this off, we would go as long as it was fun. Yes. And you know, it's been over 10 years, and for some weird reason, maybe we're masochistic, but it's still <laughs> <laughs> well, it 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 looks fun most of the time. <laughs> you know, it, yeah. it, it 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 looks uh to be that way. And I I, I can I can sympathize, you know, um, I would say chemistry is really important. It's kind of like being in a band almost, yes, <laughs> you know, like, absolutely. you know, if the, if, if, if the Joe's music, the bass player, Jason's a drummer. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a drummer too. <laughs> yeah. But once it's, you know, as, as long as John is too, supposedly it's <laughs> what is, what does supposedly mean? I've never proven it. <laughs> he, he, self-identifies yes but uh no one's actually checked the records 
Well, that's that's a very common thing today. But the but you know, but you know what's you know what's interesting. At least it's at least it's smart, right? Because if you're gonna pick one instrumentalist to be, the drummer's the one, <laughs> you know, like, to to identify as. <laughs> but I mean, um, we're gonna go with the band motif. Then I'm guess I guess I'm the groupie who followed y'all around for a while, and I was like, we're the groupie who became the bass player. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, so I can't claim, uh, you know, uh, definitely want to touch on what John said. I mean, uh, it definitely was their baby, but, um, you know, they are kind of what got me back into masonry, um, was listening to the Masonic Roundtable on my two hour commutes into DC, um, you know, even though it's only 20 miles away. So that was good one, two episodes uh, per drive. So, um, but yeah, I had, uh, yeah, I became a super fan really quick. And I guess a groupie, and uh, and then noticed these guys were actually lived not that far from me. So uh, that's how we all got together. Well, and and you know Joe Joe's rather humble um, for once, and uh, you know he he hasn't said anything about the amazing chemistry that Joe brings to the show. And uh, you know we we brought Joe into the fold not because we needed another person, but it was because Joe has made the Masonic Roundtable the best that it's been in in the 10 years that we've been on the air shit i'm gonna cry um <laughs> that's the first time he complimented me i'm gonna take a moment and just soak all that in that's lovely uh no it is super funny i, I, was, I, I was actually kind of surprised because i'm definitely different than than these two fine young gentlemen in terms of uh my manner of speech and uh the things that come oh, out of don't bring ethnicity into it it's fine <laughs> okay, right. we'll save that for the for the off reel but yeah, no, it's uh, no, it's 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 definitely been awesome getting to know uh, these handsome dudes over the years. Yeah, and I think you know, ethnicity aside, I think that one of the interesting things about people who get involved in uh, group conversations is you can, you know, you can kind of pick out the people who are. Well, I can. I have a I have a little bit of a New York radar. So you can kind of pick out people who are, you know, a little more uh direct or something like that. Uh, and I remember uh when we first started talking, that's a point that you and I kind of uh I don't know, maybe we had like a little micro bonding session where we realized that we're both from the the same island, Long Island, up in New York, which is is yeah. incredible to me. Like the more the more I travel around the country, the more I realize like we spread out. Like I don't know, like cockroaches or ants or something. Like we're all over the country. You can always more like cockroaches for sure. Yeah, because <laughs> nobody nobody we we end up somewhere and nobody wants us there. Um, but <laughs> exactly. we all most of us just look forward to getting the hell out of Long Island. Um, yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. And it's an amazing thing too when you move off of an island that you've grown up on your whole life. You're like, oh, holy shit, I can travel like nearly infinitely in any direction. Whereas, like, you you know, on Long Island, it's like you're going three directions is the are the water, and then and then the last one is is New York City. Yep. So it's 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 a liberating uh thing to to move down to the south. And um yeah, I think I think a lot of people when they hear my accent. Uh, you know, cause uh, when I get really casual, it'll come out a little more. They have a similar reaction to like seeing a, you know, a, like New Yorkers seeing a cockroach. These it's guys like, me out on it. As soon as one alcoholic beverage touches my lips, like all of a sudden the accent comes out and they're like, what the hell is that? Where's that come from? But yeah. yeah, but it's, I mean, you, you, you touched on something super interesting. I mean, yeah, it's a small Island, but you're right next to the city. Um, but it's just interesting how, and we were just up there for Easter. Uh, my mom had her 80th birthday. Uh, so I hate traveling to New York and I need a good reason. And that's a good enough reason to, to mm -hmm. you know, put the kids in the car and go. Um, but the thing my wife and I always talk about is how small Long Island is from like, not just a geographic perspective, but how kind of small the the people are somewhat right you meet a lot of those people that are like hey i'm a new yorker i'm never going to leave this is it this is the end all be all and it's like there's this great wide world that um is there if you actually you know drove 10 miles and left the island and went out yeah. to see it um but it's yeah. so yeah it's 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 like stockholm syndrome a little bit oh something. yeah absolutely that's a great way to put it and and it's it's funny that uh 
This is great. Like New York, like Long Island bashing. I love this. <laughs> I'm Get, getting it out of my system. But I, I hear my wife coming. She's about to come in and start doing the same thing. Because <laughs> we both met on Long Island. And and when we left, we were like, holy shit, the world is a better place. Yes. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My fiance and I actually, we we met on Long Island as well. She um she was from Sayville and I was from North Babylon. So she de I've definitely dated up and she dated down. But um <laughs> but but you know I when I when I go back and I tell people like, oh man, like it's actually affordable to live down here and the quality of life is better and people are nice. They're like, Well, you know, I I've got the job. I've got those golden handcuffs. Haha. And I'm like, yeah, well, everybody's got a line of shit. Now I know yours. You know, <laughs> Something called remote work. I'd love to introduce you to it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Anyway. So, um, masonry, right. <laughs> I, I'm interested, you know, uh, and, and it's something that it, obviously of necessity is, is, uh, a recurring theme and a, and a broadening and ever broadening discussion on your own podcast and the Masonic Roundtable, which is excellent. But for my audience, um, what's everybody's take on what's going on in masonry right now? You know, there's 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 an esoteric movement, there's a TO movement. You know, there's an evangelical um, proselytization movement. That's true. That's happening here, actually. But um, but what are your thoughts? That take, was take, just in Texas. Yeah. <laughs> That's a big old question. Um, yeah. I mean, everybody knows my stance on it, or, or maybe your listeners don't, but, um, you know, I'm kind of, uh, you know, there is that overarching umbrella that masonry is dying and it's going to go away. And you literally have the poster child for the date and time when it's going to happen uh, in John Ruark, right? Um, he's, he he is he's a math person and uh, he loves statistics and, uh, but yeah, if you follow the trends, you know, organized speculative Freemasonry only has a, a short amount of time left. But um, I've definitely been a convert in the, and I think everybody else here is, uh, the movement that, you know, we're refining, we're not dying. And I'm actually excited for the changes that are being forced upon the craft. Um, you know, and you have to say forced upon it, right? Because the the establishment, quote unquote, doesn't want to change. And they're totally true. fine with, you know, just... Uh, watching the Titanic go down from, from the first deck, you know? Um, so it's just interesting to see these changes and I'm super jazzed for them. And I think, I think Freemasonry, Freemasonry is never going to die. Right. Um, it's lived in one form or another right. far longer than 300 years, you know? Um, and for those of you that are seekers that are not Freemasons, it's, you know, it's all different roads to the top of the same mountain. Right. So it, it'll be there. It'll just be a little bit different. And I'm kind of jazzed to see what it's going to look like. Who else wants to take the wheel on that one? Yeah, I, I, I echo what, what Joe says. Um, and also, I think one, one of the big, beautiful parts of, of Freemasonry is the ability to kind of choose your, your flavor and your path for for seeking um i think the issue that we have here is that we've kind of taken that to the extremes as a fraternity and instead of choosing our own path to enlightenment we are now you know focused on trying to choose that path and enforce that path on other brothers and so where we're getting ourselves into trouble is when we move from a brotherhood of man under the fatherhood of God from an ecumenical, you know, God fearing organization to, hey, um, if you don't like Jesus, get out. Or, hey, you know, my my religion says we can't do this. So I'm going to ban all people who do this from membership. And, I, and I, I'm taking big swings at Christianity, but it's really just out of example as opposed to you know, having having necessarily an axe to grind there. And so we're we're seeing a lot of division within Freemasonry because it's it's very federated. So there's no Grand Lodge of the United States. It's the Grand Lodge of, of Virginia, the Grand Lodge of Texas. And so each you know Masonic jurisdiction is colored by the microcosm and the politics that that surge through the members of that jurisdiction and so a lot of friction is coming up with hey this is my masonry 
you're not doing my masonry, so screw you. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to take more of a contradictory approach. Um, yeah, so I've been passionate about where we're going in the future. Uh, as, as Joe said, like, I, I think in 2016, I really pulled together a whole bunch of data, uh, membership numbers uh, across all the jurisdictions to, to kind of see where we're going and why, why we're losing members. And, and it, it's complicated, as you could guess. Uh, mostly, it's just we're, we're dying off from the, the peak in 1959. And yet uh, the slope has been the same loss since 1959 at, on a straight path. So we've, we're not doing anything to change. And so um, what, I, what I want to be true is the whole we're not dying, we're refining. But we don't have the evidence of that yet. So um, what I mean by that is, yes, our membership numbers are getting smaller, but we really can't um, prove if we're actually refining or not. Because as Jason was saying, we're not mentoring like the hidden path, right? We have, um, we have pockets of excellence, right? So I do, do not want to diminish the, the, the traditional observance movement or now called the observance movement, right? We, um, we have esoteric pockets. We have lots more, um, especially with the, um, the children talking in the background, especially with the, the growth of online masonry, uh, where we can share knowledge a lot faster. I can hop on a, a Zoom call uh, of a lodge that's having an, an esoteric book club on the other side of the, of the continent. That's great. Um, but incentives matter. And so corporately, the administrative institution of Freemasonry is not rewarding seekers. Right? It's rewarding the fraternity. It's rewarding the institution. It's rewarding compliance. It's just like any business right. that goes from a startup to you know a Fortune 500 company. You start to you know HR works for the company. Does HR doesn't work for the employees anymore? Right. right? right. Hold stars for showing up. Yeah. So you know it's like okay. I want it to be true. I want the the spark of the esoteric concepts of masonry to be a, a driving factor, a, a known path, uh, because it's not the path for everyone. It certainly is, you know, for, yeah. uh, for the, the, the three or four, five, three or four of us, but um, it's one we had to find. Maybe that's, maybe that's the beauty of it, but um, also it's like, you don't have to be, you know, you don't have to be spoon fed it, but at least you could at least say, Hey, by the way, Here's this. Here's the door if you want to go down this route. And I don't think we're doing enough as a fraternity to at least illuminate the path for those who might be seekers. Yeah, um, I, I I agree with a lot of what everyone's saying. But did, did you have something that you want to touch on, uh, Jason? Real quick, um, illuminating the path needs to be understood as completely different and at odds with lowering the barriers to entry to the organization yes yes thank we you. are seeing thank you for clarifying a ton yes. of the latter and almost none of the former and that's one of the the key oh issues. so some more one day classes that's what i hear that's right. exactly <laughs> what you said yes oh uh, it, it's it's interesting to me because i i you know it's it's known that i'm a member of other organizations like the hermetic order the golden dawn and things like that um you know, uh, it's, you know, I even participate in the, I was born and raised Catholic, but I, I, I'm, I, you know, I have orders in, uh, more, I would say Gnostic lineages and things like that. And, um, obviously none of this stuff is Masonic affiliated or, or, uh, or positions itself to be, it's very, you know, the, the food on the plate doesn't touch. But, but, but it's um, inherently complimentary, right? It is, it can be, but everything that you touched on seems to be endemic to the entire, to the entire broader community. Um, and community of other institutions as well. Yes, sure. yes, Compliance? yes, absolutely. Es esotericism in, generally, um, things that, that are, are rooted. And I think one of the problems is this. It's this stuff is all rooted in the Western esoteric traditions, but you 100%. need. You need such a massive swath of of like a grasp on the on on history to to and a very particular bent of history that is difficult to find because it's it's typically whitewashed out of you know um, your your general 
uh, uh, overviews of, of, but in reality, the, the, the history of the Western world is the history of Western occultism and esotericism. And, and so, um, a lot of people Decide don't hide it from most everybody. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Occult is, has taken on a completely different meaning now. It means like uh, we're hiding it from, we're hiding the information from people. But, um, one of the things that I, that I find interesting is that, uh, what is happening is that things are getting smaller across the board, even though there's more interest, right? Because what's what what it's kind of like to John's point is that, or or to, to really to, to Jason's point is that you can only you can't really lower the bar so much. You cannot just you can't have you know someone asleep at the West Gate just for just for numbers. You can't do that. But one of the interesting things that that has has given me hope. Um, it, 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 or at least has resonated with me, and I want to get your take on 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 this stuff. Is there was a quote uh, a couple of years back from um, Ratzinger, uh, Pope Benedict, um, and he basically he said, uh, and this is in reference to the church, but I'm seeing it throughout spiritual organizations. The church will become small, and will have to start afresh, more or less from the beginning. She will no longer be able to inhabit many of the edifices she built in prosperity. As the number of her adherents diminishes, she will lose many of her social privileges. A small society will make much bigger demands on the initiative of her individual members. But when the trial of this sifting is passed, a great power will flow from a more spiritualized and simplified church. Uh, men in totally planned world will find themselves unspeakably lonely. If they have completely lost sight of God, they will feel the whole horror of their poverty. Then they will discover the little flock of believers as something wholly new. They will discover it as a hope that is meant for them, an answer for which they have always been searching in secret. Mm. You could have swapped out the word church and put in Freemasonry and you would have gotten the exact same tenor and tone, right? And, and I'm really- Or occult yeah. orders, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm really glad that you, you kind of opened the field a little bit there because, um, yeah, stuff is getting smaller, but I think that, um, and, and we've talked about this on, on the Masonic Roundtable, is I think for the next few years, as has been happening for the last 20 or 30 years, I think Freemasonry is still undergoing that identity crisis of we don't know what the hell we are, right? We're either a organization that wants a lot of members and wants to bring in the cash and wants to be able to fund the great big buildings that we built a hundred years ago versus are we a group of people who are putting men and in some places women through an initiatic process right um i don't think we're going to get that answer before the doors shutter on on lodges and and big so, it's, so you're talking strategy right um so again my day job you know i also uh coach executives on strategy and strategy about making choices so let me give give a, a little metaphor um parable here uh, in the neighboring county where I grew up, uh, there was a strip mall. And at the end of the strip mall, there was a, a company uh, that you could view as you were driving up, up the main road. And the name of the company was Scuba Computer. And you guessed what they did. They sold scuba gear and they also fixed and repaired computers, right? And so they were a bifurcated company and they were actually trying to do two things at the same time. And they didn't make a choice of, are they all, are they a scuba company or a computer company and when you do that you're being pulled in multiple directions you're not focusing your efforts you're not focusing your mental and spiritual energy and so it's automatically going to fail and yeah and you can guess it that that company didn't last long and i think we're doing the same thing because we're not making a choice we're not brave enough as an institution administratively to say uh we're more than just a, a green beans dinner supper club mm -hmm. that we actually are a mystical order that um, tries to take good men in the current age and make them better through a syncretic uh, formulation of, of, of different um, initiation rites. If we if we actually just came out and said that publicly, like that would be amazing yeah. to at least double down on something and make a choice instead of saying, "Well, masonry is a little bit of everything for anybody; it can be whatever you want. There are no secrets in Freemasonry," which is a bunch of bull. Yeah, well, I, I'm, I, I'm I'm very quickly I'm reminded of the Confucian saying, "The man who chases two rabbits catches neither." Yes, I love it.
And, and Ike too, this is, this is nothing new. When you look back to the fifth century BCE and the cult of Pythagoras, you know, it's been said that Pythagoras actually had two types of initiates. He had the initiates who were kind of the high initiates who truly got it. They went through the vows of silence. They didn't eat beans. Um, and they were entrusted with the higher mysteries of the order, whereas the lower initiates of the cult of Pythagoras were only privy to kind of surface level deep teachings of, of Pythagoras. And then, you know, ultimately when Pythagoras died, a little bit of infighting, but everything just kind of washed away until, um, you know, until Aristotle and Plato, Plato picked it up. That's right. Know, Couple you, that, or a couple centuries later. I mean, you you just touched on something that is is so inherent to, or the way it should be inherent to every single initiatic order that's out there, right? And we kind of forget that in Freemasonry, right? Because so many Freemasons only care about the numbers, right? I need X number of people in this lodge. Yep. I need I need to raise this many people. But we seem to forget that every other initiatic system throughout history has always had that that initiation that got you to the porch. And then that initiation that if you chose, if you made the choice on your on your own to go that step further, you could continue to walk the path, right? But we've forgotten that, right? And and I think it's also exacerbated by, you know, once you raise, you know, I, I don't know how it is in, well, I actually do know how it is in North Carolina because <laughs> uh, we've been there. Um, you know, most of your jurisdictions, you know, as soon as that that new brother is, is raised and everybody's cheering and super excited for him. What do they do? They throw a ton of petitions at him, right? Join the shrine, join this, join the York, right? Join the Scottish, right? Join all this crap. There's Come more stuff there. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Get in line. Doing officers chair. But you know, we, we seem to forget. And I think, I think all of us will agree being Freemasons for, for more than a day, you start to notice after a while that, that craft masonry really is, you're sitting at the porch, right? Everybody's sitting at the porch together, and it's only going to be a select few that choose to keep walking further and further into the temple. Um, and I'm okay with that. I'm really okay with that. I have I have something interesting just kind of brought to mind based off of um, uh, something Jason said about um, Pythagoreans. I mean, I, that's my that's my love language. I mean, I've got I've got a tattoo of Pythagoras on my body. I remember I showed it I showed it to my mother, and uh, she said, "Who's that?" And I said, "Pythagoras," and she just started crying. And uh, my buddy Nick made the joke like, "My mother and Pythagoras's mother are the only two women who have ever like cried that name." <laughs> but but I I mean I'm I'm a huge that's I mean ethnically I'm I'm of Greek background and my dad started me on Plato at a very young age. Um, I don't know what the hell he was expecting to have happened, but uh, uh, the it thing it yeah well not not the way he wanted it to. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I like checked out of society, became a musician. I'm pretty sure he was hoping I'd be, like go into law school or something, you know. But um, he uh, the interesting thing to me that I found to be, and this is going to be controversial, especially coming from somebody like me. Um, but one of the things I found to be disturbing, again, not just in Freemasonry, um, because I do find a little bit more tact there but in the broader occult communities in general, the internet has really um, allowed this level of superficiality to come in. And what I think happens, especially at that early stage, as, uh, as Joe was saying, when you're on the porch, um, you don't really allow the Alembic to remain sealed, if you take my meaning. And what reminded me of this was what Jason was saying. He was saying that there were two levels of initiates and they had uh, avoided the beans and, you know, they had done all the, the what fours. Um, but they one of the, that the, or something. Yeah. I mean, the first thing though, that a Pythagorean initiate did was put a pebble in their mouth for five years. They were quiet. They were silent. And if you, the akusmatikoi, that means listeners, you're listening. Um, and I find that lots of people want to be the teachers right out of the gate. And what's happening is they're getting in the way of their own personal initiatic processes. That's my that's a thought that that I keep running into because I, I ask myself, like, am I doing more more fucking harm than good? 
is am I just contributing to the white noise out there? You know, in 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 that kind of thing. But I I do see it as a real impediment uh, potentially to this you know flourishing um, of of the Masonic fraternity. So so let me hear what you guys have to have to say about that. Am I am I? You think I'm just being overly cynical? Well, no. So I think I've I'm going to directly tie this back to what we talked about on the show last night. Uh, we did uh, a show on solar eclipse lunacy and right in the crosshairs were TikTokers. And so when you said teachers, I'm like, oh, those members who join an order and immediately jump on TikTok and just start wax and poetic about pure unadulterated bullshit. Exactly. That's the problem. When you when you look at something, and, and the problem is really framed around ego, right? I am the expert. I am the authority. I use my affiliation with certain orders to validate, you know, and elevate my status in my, you know, hierophantic, you know, nature. What we are doing is we are uh, flipping that on its head, and we are humble seekers and educators who say based on either my experience which is one data point or a collective set of anecdotal experiences which starts to become actual data or empirical data um these are the conclusions that we're drawing that's very what well said because none of us presume to speak on behalf of freemasonry we speak right. on behalf of ourselves and our experiences, but we are always open to and, and cognizant of the fact that our experience is unique to us and we always have more to learn. Well, I, I mean, before you draw the distinction. No, it, it, I was I was just going to dovetail on that. I, I think you, you summed it up best at the very beginning where you said it's it's 100 percent ego driven. Right. And the, and the whole point, no matter what initiatic order you're talking to, you're you're. You're contemplating your own life choices with the ultimate goal of the death of your ego, right? But again, you've got this exact opposite effect because we now have platforms. And and, and let me say, Brother Ike, you, you are absolutely not contributing to the white noise um, because, again, Present I think, company excluded. Yes, because I think you're like us in that you you qualify, at least everything I've heard so far, everything that you say with the, hey, this is my thought, my opinion, um, my idea as opposed to again the you know the the new masonic tiktok movement which we sound like old farts just complaining about tiktok but we're not i love tiktok it keeps me super busy Get off my lawn. when i'm on when i'm in the bathroom for 30 minutes it keeps me totally engaged but um you know it's it's Strong it's all, floor will help <laughs> it's all ego right it's like you get a person that you know they start off the conversation and we talked about this last night they start the conversation, well, I'm Joe, I'm a 32nd degree Scottish Rite Mason, and everything I'm about to say is based on that fact, and that's how it qualifies. And that's just bullshit, you know? And I don't think we call it out enough. Right. I do have one counterpoint, too, again, because I, I seem to be the guy who's always going to disagree. I will say that my yeah. origin story with masonry and, like, the fun part, the, the secret squirrel stuff, is critical thinking. Um, when I was a, a young, fresh... You know, Master Mason, I ran on the internet. And of course, it wasn't as flooded with weirdos uh, and conspiracy theories um, as much. Eh, no, the only, the only uh, religious zealots who were writing about Freemasonry at the time were the major denominations, That's like true. the Presbyterians and the Southern Baptists. You're, you're not wrong. Um, but I was able to find things that I didn't wasn't going to hear about in my religion, things I wasn't going to hear about in my lodge. So I'm getting exciting. I'm, I'm finding all these like, mystic connections to symbolism that i saw during the three degrees and I, i'll never forget the first meeting when i i went back into lodge to talk to some past masters who are all oh, oh so revered in lodge i was like hey you know catching them at dinner right before you're know, going into, into the uh into the the tiled portion of the meeting i was like hey check out this really cool thing that i learned and all that and i'd get these like blank stares from gentlemen who've been in the craft for decades going 
I, n- I never heard anything about that before. And like, it's almost like I was just speaking either a different language or something completely irrelevant to their life experience about Freemasonry and what it is. And so I'm like, am, am I wrong? No, it must be the children that are wrong. Like I, I was having this yeah, existential, my green beans. yeah, I was having this existential like split because I was I was applying critical thinking and and going out and looking for those things. And yet, while there is a lot of content out there now that is, you know, if you could just search all the conspiracy uh, Masonic videos on, on YouTube and TikTok, mm-hmm. um, yeah, we should be teaching, uh, especially, you know, our, our newer uh, initiates to say, hey, you're going to see some weird stuff out there. But like, don't just go on a single source, right? Make sure you check the facts. Make sure you go back and check the sources from Wikipedia. Make sure that you're actually getting multiple books about a topic to make sure that you're really pulling this information together to form an educated view and not just going off of one one celebrity or one you know uh, influencer's perspective. Mm-hmm. And so I, again, I, I think there's a positive side to the wealth of information. It's just, we live in the information age and ignorance is a choice. So as long as we can apply critical thinking to sort through that, we have to be taught. Some people have to be taught that. So that's, yeah. that's all I'm, I'm implying. Yeah. It, well, it's, it's interesting. One of the things that, and I, and I see a lot of uh, people doing now um, is, or lodges, I should say, brethren, taking charge of um we're doing outreach uh you know a little bit more because it's something that's interesting to me is like one of the first things i wanted to know when i got involved in masonry is like why is it that there is such this there's such a disparity between the older generations and the incoming um or the newer generations in terms of what how they're contextualizing Freemasonry and what is it, you know, what, how did that happen? And, you know, there are many opinions, there are many thoughts and many answers, you know, the exoterrification of it in, you know, that joiner period, especially like between the first and second world wars. And then after the second world war, where everything essentially became community based and was like became the Elks club and, and, and stuff like that, you know, there, there's some of that in there, but one of the things it's kind of a moot point, at this point, I think. And one of the things that we need to focus on going forward is outreach because we are more like, I think, um, the people, and this is true of every, you know, succeeding generation. We have, we have a, a lot more, I think, in common with the way that we communicate and that the way, the way we are able to articulate and contextualize things with the, you know, incoming or prospective, uh, or I would say interested people interested in Freemason because there are a lot of women interested in what is this? Tell me more about this. So one of the things that we're doing is, um, so, you know, uh, shameless self-promotion here. Um, we are hosting uh, the uh, Southeastern Masonic Symposium in Asheville at 80 Broadway, the Asheville Masonic Temple. That's nice. going to be, uh, yeah, June um, 8th and 9th. And so there's there's a tiled track, right? Um, and there's uh, an, a non-tiled track that's open to the public. And they get to come in and see a separate group of presentations, explore the lodge. Um, you can tune in from uh, digitally uh, via Zoom um, and ask questions. There'll be a panel after, you know, the four or five presentations we go through that Saturday uh, that are catered to kind of dispelling myths of of freemasonry that are out there in the conspiracy community so it's kind of like a like an ama slash nice. you know ask a mason you know so um <laughs> i don't know uh and then you guys are having esoteric on right yep. yeah yeah absolutely and uh, i'm so glad you you mentioned that and i love the fact that uh number one sorry that I can't go i was looking forward to going um but we'll, we'll we'll catch we'll catch one of your events soon but yeah the week after yours uh father's day weekend we're going to be hosting what is this our fifth Fifth. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Fourth, fourth, we took last year off. Sure. Whatever Jason said. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so, and it's a really funny story. We actually started the first year um, wanting to be an esoteric conference for Freemasons. And we quickly learned through both 
positive and negative feedback that um, we needed to make a choice and say, hey, are we going to put the umbrella of Freemasonry over this conference or are we going to open it up to, uh, you know, a more worldly view of esoteric thoughts and ideas? And we quickly pivoted on that and we were like, um, because again, we were getting a lot of pushback um, from people saying, oh, you know, this isn't Freemasonry and this, that, and the other thing. A lot of the things that, that John was being told just in a, a less nicer way. And, um, but we quickly pivoted and said, fuck it. Um, we can take the whole Masonic umbrella off of it and uh, it's going to be purely esoteric and everybody's welcome. We're not going to tile shit because, um, you know, the outside of the ritual and the words that you use inside a Masonic Lodge, those secrets are pretty common amongst all the different groups and organizations that are out there in the world, right? So there, there is nothing secret. You just got to be able to draw from the well yourself. And uh, I think as a result of making that choice, I think we've been far more successful than than we ever thought we would be, right? Like just by ripping off the square and compass yeah. and deciding to be a more open and ecumenical place for people to get together. And we get we get dudes who aren't Masons. We get ladies who are Masons. We get seekers of all different shapes and colors and sizes. And it's it makes for a much better time. It really does. It really and people does. flying in from Alaska. Yeah. Come see us. Yeah. Uh, and and it's, uh, funny enough, in 2019, when we kicked this off, we had to make a game time decision because we had tiled lectures. Like literally the hour before we started. The hour before we started, we had two amazing brethren come up who weren't recognized by our grand jurisdiction and we were like fuck these guys came from nevada they bought tickets we are not having them sit outside for three hours yeah and we made our speakers amend their presentations on the fly well that's that's that egalitarian and inclusive spirit i think is a keystone of masonry in the first place it right. should be or it should, should be, be. yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, so esotericon, right? Very, very. Um, that to me is is uh, I don't want to say provocative in in a negative sense, but a, a way that would provoke in me uh, uh, quite a bit of interest. Um, and I think that that's going to be true uh, for a lot of people that are are hearing about this for the first time. I'll include links just for anybody who's listening. Uh, there's there will be there's links in the about section of this video. Now, I'm interested to uh, to have you guys elaborate a little bit more on what what at the current time is really piquing your interest on the esoteric side of Freemasonry. Or uh, you know, uh, I know that I'm among like minds here in terms of occultism and and, and that kind of stuff. You guys, um, you know. Uh, Brother Jason has has shared with me some of the the work that he's done on Agrippa and stuff like that. So uh, whoever wants to kind of uh, hit that and 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 let me know what you think. What's really piquing your interest at the moment? So how many hours on. do we have? Yeah, exactly. Like, who we, who gets to talk first? <laughs> we get. Well, I I mean I can keep going. I can go. I can go another hour if you guys. But uh, you know, we'll don't don't feel any pressure to to keep it brief it just goes speak from the heart uh i'll go first because i'm the rude new yorker uh yeah no i mean what's always piqued my curiosity the most uh is especially going going back to the motherland is um you know the the process of initiation throughout all the different societies in history most notably i mean uh one of my favorite things to research and, and delve more into and and speak on and learn about um you know are the mystery schools of old the schools of eleusis and the schools of pythagoras um you know your your uh, the orphic mysteries you know the ancient greeks um were the first ones that really started to uh kind of what we talked about on the show last night really started to merge the concept of belief and science into a a well-defined path that would take someone from being a seeker to someone who could could walk the path of enlightenment you know and it really it really starts there uh, i mean you had schools prior to that you know egypt and and ancient mesopotamia and things like that and you did have rituals but i think it was greece that really started to pave the way it's like oh we can explain why all this stuff starts to happen and we're going to wrap it in allegory and they knew it was allegory you know um but they had a defined process that took someone from being uninitiated to a true seeker and gave them a path to follow um so i mean for me i think 
from now until until I get bored or old. Um, I mean, that's always going to be the the thing that piques my curiosity. And uh, I mean, like I said, it was, uh, and I think we talked about this in in Messenger. Um, it was amazing going to the city of Eleusis and and walking that path. Mind you, everybody's been dead for thousands of years who do it. Um, but it was just breathtaking. I'm like, holy shit, I get it, and I understand you know, why they did what they did. And, and from what we know, right, because a lot of it was unwritten, because unlike Freemasons, they actually kept their mouth shut on things and didn't post things on the internet. So, um, well, because they'd kill you if you opened your mouth. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, that that's what's always piqued my curiosity. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so I'll, ju I'll jump in in general. So just to build on that origin story of um, Masonic education, one thing that becoming a master Mason and then trying to search up educational topics exposed me to other religious systems and mystical traditions that I would not have got in my, my upbringing born and raised Methodist, uh, stayed, stayed relatively active in the Methodist church, uh, my entire life. And then I see all these weird things about like Kabbalah and tarot and Boda and like all these other adjacent, things to uh, the masonic tradition and i'm like okay do, at first i feel dirty do, like do i need a shower because like i'm not supposed to be reading this and then the more that i read i find that there are christian influences to these things there are christian adaptations there is a christian kabbalah as well and so okay now i had i had the the God permission to say, it's okay. You can study this weird stuff as long as like, you know, you, you wrap the Jesus layer on top of it. Like, and, and that's how I started viewing. Yeah. Just, just wrap it up with, with a good old uh, saran wrap. Jesus saran wrap. And that was the filter and still continues to be the filter in which I look at a lot of these mystery schools because I, I love the foundation that I grew up from a religious aspect but I'm now shifting from the religious institution to the spiritual personal experience. And I mean, Hey, that's, that's what the journey should be about for all of us. And uh, so I'm really jazzed. Anytime I learn about Christian meditation and, and uh, Christian ecstasy and, and really just learning more about um, just reintegrating with the, with the divine. Like if, if I can get there uh, to know and be with my, creator better than i ever have like why wouldn't you want to do that so that's that's those are the types of things that i i love to research both from you know the historical you know influences as well as then the practical like i i really like to take a step beyond i, I see a lot of esoteric podcasts and sources that that say oh we're going to talk all about esoterics but it's just going to be the surface layer or the historical layer i'm like well, what made it cool? Like, I want to know what was the actual practice. It's like reading about doing push-ups. I don't yeah. want to read about doing push-ups. I want to do the push-up and get that get that actual yeah. experience. No one wants to do push-ups, John. No. No. <laughs> yeah, I, that's a good point. It's a good point, and that's it's one of the things that I think I maybe I rail too much against is the idea that people like belief is a is a four letter word it's a dirty word in these communities yeah. um uh, i think people are afraid of sounding foolish i think other people yeah. have to preserve you know there are university professors talking about this stuff that could lose tenure you know um but if you say the wrong thing yeah yeah but but over so i i can understand that but overall yeah i think that there there needs to be more outlets for people to discuss this the way that you would discuss any other craft you know you have to acknowledge that it exists <laughs> How about you, Jason? Yeah, so I for me, um, I'll try to I'll try to shorten this up, but uh, I'm I'm partially the product of kind of a pseudo evangelical upbringing, partially the product of the satanic panic of the eighties, right? You know, I, I grew up knowing that, or or being told that you know using tarot cards was you know demon worship and you know devil. Here, uh, here I am with you know. Tarot de Marseille, et cetera. Um, and, you know, Dungeons and Dragons was demons. And, you know, you you couldn't think certain things or read certain things because you would let a demon into your life and you'd go to hell. And, and so, 
you know, I went on a long process of spiritual kind of deconstruction and subsequent reconstruction over the course of about 10 years after I had joined Masonry. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm a relative newcomer to occult philosophy and esoteric studies. And so I'm approaching it from, from two avenues. One, learning all I can. And just getting wrapping my my hands around foundational esoteric concepts, meditation, contemplation, uh, reintegration with with the divine, strengthening my own relationship with the Creator, and bringing that loving relationship to everyone I meet and everyone around me. The other piece of this, and this is where you and I were talking a bit is I, I have a passion for making things more accessible. And so in my career, uh, you know, I was a history major and now I lead programs on generative AI. Um, you know, a bit of a difference, but the, the core mechanic is that I take very complex technological, you know, things and ideas and I boil them down and reduce them so that they're just slightly more accessible to help people get in the door just a little bit easier, find their niche, and then go for the real crazy stuff. And so that was really my purpose in undertaking my study of Agrippa's Three Books of Occult Philosophy. I'm like, wow, everybody says that this is like one of the the most important medieval occult philosophy references of all time. But nobody can really summarize it or, or get at what the meaning is. And so for Esotericon, I'm doing Occult Philosophy 101. And it's designed to just lower that barrier to entry ever so slightly so that more people get to the porch. Mm -hmm. And once they get to the porch, they can self-select how deep into the inner chamber they want to go and so for me yeah i i'm learning everything that i can and figuring out what it means to me and my personal journey and my personal relationship with the divine but then as a part of this i want to make it more accessible to others so that they can take the first step which is the hardest step of beginning their own personal journeys to discover their relationship with their god yeah, and I see a lot of oh, I see a lot of confluence there, um, right? I think just uh, of necessity, naturally, kind of um, these things are all built upon each other as they transmit through time. You know, after the after the seventh and eighth century, you cannot you cannot take Christianity out of occultism. I mean, Agrippa. A lot of people like to paint the picture, or at least in decades prior to more recent erudition and acknowledgement, they like to paint the picture that he was a bit of, um, you know, uh, had a bit of an heretical spirit, which in reality did not. He was extreme, Agrippa was extremely devout Christian. He was just attempting to point Remember out- Catholic bishop. Yeah, exactly. And these people were trying to point out that like these, these, path, these trajectories are not incompatible. In fact, one kind of- elucidates the other you know and it's it's all about what angle you're viewing it from and and if there's fear and superstition um you're not you're it's going to cloud your judgment and and going back to what uh brother joe was talking about uh we know that there is a very clear through line from platonism you know uh hellenic socratic philosophy to christianity and it actually they they kind of particularly in gnosticism which if we go back to uh, what Brother John was talking about, that personal direct experience, you know, the actual gnosis, it's really one clear through line of, of transmission. And, and I really can appreciate that you guys are hitting it from these different, different levels. I think there's a, a lot to contribute in terms of finally like making this stuff clear to people, you know, um, and in reality, we we do have now we have more at our fingertips than ever. You know, it is the information age, um, but we also have good information now. 
you know, um, and there's there's a, a higher standard of academic rigor that comes with this stuff. There are more translations. There are more people um, being able to to elaborate this stuff from from uh, many different angles. But oh, um, there's there's sorry to cut you off there, brother. Ike, but please. for as many awesome resources as you have, there's also more bullshit. That's also so it, it's coming in equal numbers, right? And it, it, to your vertical brand, thinking you mentioned this earlier. It's just how do I discern what the noise is versus like what's an actual viable resource that I should spend sweat equity on, you know? Um, and well, I how do you do it? Well, um, that's can a great we question. Just say, can we just say that the occult is a full contact sport? <laughs> You've got to like fucking it. work for it. Yeah, yeah, no, spot on. I mean, and, and I think it's a great question, what, what you asked. I mean, I, I think, honestly, um, the first thing you should do is if you're only reading one single thing or listening to one single person, all the way back to John's point, you should probably say, hey, I need more sources or I need to broach the conversation and, and bring it out a little further. Um, because if it's coming from a single place, then it's probably not good data. Um, you know, it's probably white noise. So, I mean, corroborating sources. I mean, all of us here have done research. Um, there is a big difference between asking Chat GPT to write your paper or just citing all of Wikipedia without actually looking at all the shit that the Wikipedia article contains versus creating well-crafted research and turning that into a presentation or a paper or a book or what have you. Um, so, you know, I, th I think we belittle research as a society, right? Like it's, it's so much faster to get the quick answer. Um, you know, and I think that permeates into all the things we've been talking about, you know, the seeker versus the, you know, the porch sitter. So, yeah, I, I think that the, and that, that's a great answer. And I think for a lot of, a lot of us who are a little bit older, um, you know, I'm in my late thirties at this point. Oh, you're so young. We have, we have a little bit, we, well, your baby, your baby. Oh, well, well, my, my. My back is not young anymore, but I, uh, it's a consequence of carpentry, but I, I, um, I think that there is something that's kind of getting lost in the mix right now that, and that the only thing I would add, uh, for anybody who's listening to that is stop real quick before you go any further, before you spend any money on books, make sure that you do indeed know how to think critically. I think, you know, know thyself you know that might be the first but right exactly beautiful you know is like you got to make sure that the whole operating system is not fucked up <laughs> you know? True. which is that's a lifetime's work in and of itself well i mean Jason study, is, study uh, critical thinking uh, argument and rhetoric Sorry, Joe, go ahead. No, I was I was actually complimenting you for a change. Um, I mean, Jason is literally the poster child for that, right? Like he's gotten decades and decades of programming. And then at a certain point in time, he said, fuck this. I'm going to I'm going to use critical thinking and figure it out for myself and find the path that works for me. I mean, that is, you know, Jason's story is is just a love story to, to walking the path. Right. And, and I can't describe it in any other way. But again i we, haven't figured my shit out yet i just that's wanna... okay you got a lifetime to do that shit you know but the, i mean the point is is that you you know which direction you want to paddle you know down the yeah. stream but i think again going back to what you were saying brother ike it's it's how do you navigate for for your for your brand new mason or your brand new seeker or your brand new initiate um who can you know break the chains of of conventionality how do they start it's it's scary, right? When you're alone and you don't know anybody else to talk to, and or like John walking into his his first meeting um, and looking at a bunch of past masters and like we don't know what the fuck you're talking about, man. You mm -hmm. know, um, you know all that weird esoteric shit. That's not masonry. You know, go have mm -hmm. go have green beans and meatloaf. You know, we're excited because we don't we don't swear on TMR. <laughs> I know, well, and that's like my usual my usual tip <laughs> there is. is... <laughs> Yeah, no, I know, I know. It's they call it the New York comma. It's, yes. Fuck. <laughs> yeah. It's a qualifier. <clears throat> yeah. Well, um, you know, um, brother Jason, you and I had a a, a brief conversation um, fairly recently, mm -hmm. and, and I really enjoyed some of the things that you had to say about initiation and you know, pursuing esotericism through initiation. 
So I, I was wondering if we could explore some thoughts, you know, uh, not to bel belabor a point, but there was, there's definitely, I think one of the things that's encouraging people, young people to come to masonry and then young men come to masonry and, and, um, and women to co-masonry and things like that is that there is this, this flavor of the mysterious and the numinous that has been kind of, um, it has spread. It is be. It is diffused itself throughout even popular culture. It takes like these little weird dark turns, but I think that that excites people towards that aesthetic. Will draw people in, and um. But I do think that there is some, well, more than some validity to the idea that masonry truly is at its heart esoteric, um, and that, you know potentially fruitful lines of progress and investigation can come through uh, exoteric um, exploration or interpretation of masonry. I mean, I that's, I guess, just a summary of, 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 of the general sentiment of our conversation. But I was wondering if you had anything that you wanted to, to add for anybody that might be listening. That's kind of like I don't know. What is it? You guys do charity, right? Because we we're talking about before, we don't really know what we are. So is there some kind of, you know, definitive statement you can make at least about your own personal journey, um, you know, uh, in masonry getting, and, and what brought you to the esoteric side of it? So I will, I will be brief because I know these other guys have, have a lot of great stuff to say about this as well. Why, why do you see, why do you seek to understand that which is complex and hidden and difficult to understand? I would argue that the true secret of an, the true secret power of initiation is its transformative nature. And so if you are seeking knowledge, it's it's not just to to be on the in club and know know the top secret masonry stuff, right? Um, to be a true aspirant, uh, you must have a, an unflinching, unfailing belief in the transformative power of that knowledge that you are to gain by going through this initiatic process. And if you suppose that that is true, then Freemasonry is, is, you know, very similar to, you know, the initiate the initiatic orders of of old whether it be the pythagoreans the the orphic cults um or you know the uh, the cult of mithras right for freemasonry we come together with two overtly dogmatic assertions you know if freemasonry is very ecumenical very hey as long as like you're good with the guy upstairs we don't care what form it takes right um, but in masonry, at least you now I'm talking first three degrees, what we call craft masonry or blue lodge masonry, there are two over dogmatic assertions that are made. One, there is a supreme power that created the universe and everything in it. And two, your soul is immortal, whatever, whatever soul means to you, right? And so because of those two dogmatic assertions, Everything in the initiatic journey teaches you how to better wrap your head around that, how to better know the creator, and how to better take comfort in and wrap your arms around the fact that you are immortal and loved by God, and you will live past this life. It's, you know, the secret of Freemasonry is, is the, is the passion play and the initiation that unfolds the mystery of the, the immortality of the soul. And that to me is why Freemasonry is so compelling as an initiatic order when it's done well. And when I think the aspirant truly understands, um, and truly believes in the transformative power of the ritual because otherwise you're just going through kind of a, you know, a, a hazing, right. 
and, and you know we don't haze but you you know what i'm saying you know there's a college fraternity right that you know yeah you're just getting your lumps to to be in the in club and i think one of our issues is that we have way too many folks today that are in it to be in the in club as opposed to truly understanding the transformative power to to completely and utterly change your life that's why we that's why we pay homage to oh freemasons take good men and make them better and then we get like the freemason down the street that you know stole half a million dollars from a masonic widow and went to jail or is a racist or, or yeah right. exactly yeah no i think i think number one that was absolutely beautiful yeah i i totally couldn't add anything to that but um i i can't shut up so i will say something but uh yeah no just to, <laughs> just to put some color on, on on the question you had brother ike um i don't know i don't know what you guys think but i've seen um you know especially uh being an officer in my lodge for the last what eight years a lot of newer masons or people that are walking through the door are more informed people that kind of get the idea of what freemasonry is all about before they actually walk in that door you know they're like hey i saw this or i saw this netflix documentary or this or i've read these books or i've been a fan of manly p hall for 20 years and you know just all this it, it's not just the the what you saw 10 years ago where it's oh my dad was a mason so that's why i'm here you know, and for no other reason, you know, you're actually people getting people who are asking questions and are seekers. And I think that's, that's amazing, right? Like, we're, we're, we're finally getting the type of people that we want, even though our numbers are dwindling. And even though lodges are closing, like, I think we're, we're on that refining kick. But the only thing I'll add to, to what Jason said is, is in addition yeah, to what you just added, indeed, I will add more to that addition. Um, but yeah, it's, um, it's really interesting that in spite of our identity crisis, you know, there, there is a, a path forward there. Right. And, and we've talked, the three of us have talked about this in lodge uh, under the same roof where, you know, brother, Ike, you mentioned, you know, are we a charity? Are we a social club? Are we a fraternal organization? No, we're not any of those things. Right. As much as, you know, grand lodges would like to say different, we're, we're not right. We are a system of transformation that leads in regular lodges, men through the process of initiation, right? And and as a result of that, if you actually pay attention and if you give a shit, and if you understand the lessons that are being taught to you, you and if you're transformed by initiation, then you will become a more generous person and you will become organically more charitable. You will become a more social person with those that you choose to trust and love that have walked that path with you. Um, you will become more fraternal and bonded with them just by having gone through that same process of initiation. That's been the same for 300 plus years. So I think those are all organic offshoots, but again, it, it gets caught in the noise of, well, we're a fraternity or we're a social club or we're a fraternal organization. No, we're not. Yeah, chari charity is love. Charity is not united way. Right? And if yeah. you're truly transforming yourself, your love for mankind extends to charitable works because of a direct consequence of the fact that you are not the person you were before initiation. Yeah, I think one of the duties too, though, I will say that it should be, um, and I think it initially was, is transmission. It's it's very important that we transmit what's going on. I think the, the North Carolina jurisdiction has a beautiful um, charge speech about it, you know, and thus, uh, um, thus, thus was transmitted unimpaired through the succession of ages, the most excellent tenets of our honorable fraternity we have um, it too yeah and and it, it's it, it that to me i mean you know when something kind of really resonates with you it makes your hair you know the, the hair on your arm stand up and and um because it first of all it kind of alludes to this idea that oh there are there were brethren generations beforehand that admitted this stuff <laughs> you know maybe maybe not the guys i'm sitting in the old hats I'm sitting in lodge with right now, but you know, I feel I feel an affirmation that this stuff will, is is a system of transmission, and you know, 
I would say that 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 we do have a duty to to continue to to transmit the um, the teachings. Now, I do think that you've, just from my 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 work in occultism generally and, and and esoteric orders is that the symbols themselves are the are are the teachings. Right? They can awaken things on a very very deep level in a practitioner um, in an initiate, and the rest is kind of commentary. To help you kind of contextualize what we're talking about, right? I mean, this is the 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 synchronon of of Freemasonry is symbolism, right? Is it uh, a the beautiful... symbols? The symbols are the way markers and the boundaries for personal interpretation. Right, right. Because it, you could it, it for each initiate, it's going to it's going to awaken or evoke something. You know, it's not going to be uniform. But it's it that's the kind of has that potency to to communicate um you know certain certain spiritual things. I'd say that is that's the thing that that is is really inextricable from Masonic symbolism is that they have a numinous quality. It's not it's not strictly mundane. But yeah, I mean to your point, but it's it's the the whole point of symbolism is to be that graphical reminder for you that there's something there behind it right like everybody knows that a stop sign is an octagon and it's red and everybody knows what that means if even if there's no words on it right or the so, nike swoosh right or the, or... right exactly mm -hmm. so i mean it's there are other symbols and you know brother right you're a seeker you're in other organizations beside masonry there are other symbols that talk about the synergies between the divine and the earthly right it's not just the square and compass you know um so uh, again, I think to to Jason's point, yeah, those are the things that we use symbols because you can remember symbols, right? Symbols are easier to remember than you know pages and pages and pages exactly. of Albert Pike, you know, um, who loved adjectives and hated commas. But um, <laughs> you know, but yeah, I, I think the way marker analogy, I think, is is spot on. Well, it saves it 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 guards against or or should guard against some of the bullshit too. Like, you know, oh, there's this big symbol of the sun. And to me, the sun's really cold. And so I'm going to say that, you know, this part is is emblematical of being frozen in time. And no, the sun's not cold. <laughs> Shut the fuck up. Exactly. Exactly. One of the things that's interesting to me, too, is is the is geometry playing a big part in masonry. Because geometry, if when you understand geometry and you actually kind of examine it, from a Pythagorean or Neo-Pythagorean or even Euclidean context is that these things actually, they have a, a mathematical significance that translates to something, some sort of spiritual analogy uh, taking place, you know, or underlying material creation, the, the, like, you know, the pentagram or something like that. It's, it's it, 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 geometrically, it's symbol, it, you know, it, it, it contains phi, you know, the golden ratio, but by all the pent alphas and, and and things of that nature. So th to me, that's also another thread of symbolism. If you really start to examine the geometrical tack that that um, Freemasonry starts to take at a certain point, um, there there's certain uh, I would say objective truths at the bottom of that uh, that symbol. But I um I have, as you may or may not know, I have some canned questions. As we come to the to to the end of of our discussion today, um, I usually ask people for I put them on the spot and be like for anybody that's listened to this podcast episode today and is interested in maybe going a little further or becoming more uh, acquainted with some of the stuff we talked about recommend three books. Now I've got three of you here, so you can each do one book. Or just, I mean, we're all nerds, so as many books as you want. Go ahead. Uh, who wants I to? Don't start? have the time. <laughs> I think we're going to pick all different books. Um, just Probably. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'll go first. Everybody here knows I'm a super huge Manly P. Hall fan. Um, he was my gateway drug into the weird shit that we love to talk about. Um, so I'm going to go with Lost Keys of Freemasonry. Um, I think for a seeker. Um, it's definitely a lot more accessible than secret teachings. Um, I mean, you got to be paying attention to read secret teachings, um, you know, and not be farting around, playing on your phone, doing Candy Crush at the same time. Like, you got to sit down and pay attention. Um, but for me, Lost Keys, for a lot of 
uh, new brothers or brothers that want to get into, you know, the more spiritual and esoteric side of Freemasonry, it's a great gateway book. Um, and it's accessible and it's easy to read. And it's a fun read. I mean, I, I, I can read it over and over again. So Lost Keys of Freemasonry by Manly P. Hall. You have two more you want to share, Joe? Oh, I thought we were doing one each. It was oh, being nice. You for want three? Shit. It's, okay. It's, it's no. It's as many as it's as many as you want. <laughs> um. Yeah. Okay. Anything by yeah, one each, and and we resoundingly said, "Fuck no." I wasn't there for that. Okay, so I would say I did not say um, that. The next one is basically Close anything by Merceau Eliade. Um, yes. So anything that he wrote, he was a uh, anthropologist. I believe he worked at the University of Chicago. Um, but he has done pretty much the modern standard of work on systems of initiation that go all the way back to ancient and aboriginal times. Um, he gets it. Um, he, it's a scholarly read, um, but mm -hmm. it's super fascinating. It talks, mm -hmm. doesn't talk about Freemasonry that much, but if you're a Freemason, you will get every single thing that he writes. Um, he's got a three book series plus some other books, but anything by Marceau Eliade. And then shit, the third book. Um, all my books are gone because I had my office redone. So um, <laughs> they're actually just comic books that are there. But John um, and I both pivoted to our respective. I know you books. bastards. I can't look at my bookshelf. Re rec recommend, <laughs> a, recommend a comic book. Then. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. All right, cool. Yeah, I'm a super big comic book nerd. Um, uh, let's see. Um, I just got my daughter into The Sandman by Neil Gaiman. Um, nice. It was a TV nice. show on Netflix. Um, if you like the TV show, the the comic book, the first couple of trades is – spot on what you saw on the netflix show um neil gaiman's i mean neil gaiman's awesome he's written american gods mm -hmm. um a whole bunch of other stuff in prose so uh yeah neil gaiman fabulous comic book author great thank you brother boom all right john you want to go or should i i'm at the ready here we go do it um, fire away so pew 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 so one that if you're kind of interested in the other side of Christianity, uh, a good one to kick things off is Inner Christianity by Richard Smoley. Beautiful. Uh, not a Mason, but he does allude to how Masonry and the other side, the hidden side of the spiritual journey. And he was a speaker the Masons, at Terracon last year. He did, the Mason, he did like Peter, took his ear. That's right. So yeah, um, it's it's again it's accessible he has some some little practical things in there that you can try um but again it's one of those books that gives you permission to to dig deeper um one i don't have a physical copy of because i've listened to it on audiobook a million times is the alchemist by paulo coelho um, it's a great book. and the only thing i would i always preface it um whenever i recommend it is read it as an allegory as an allegorical story about your life where you are the protagonist. Mm -hmm. So if you know that going in, right, it's it's like the greatest video game you've ever played because you're now thinking as the protagonist is going through his his transformation, uh, what does this mean to me and where I am in my life right now? And so I, I, that's a book that I pick up every year and reread. And then uh, and then for a fun one, um, The Jedi Path, right? Nice. It's a, a nice little Star Wars compendium as being a Star Wars nerd. I really like how they built the the lore around what it means to be a Jedi Knight as far as the religious aspect of it. And so what does it mean? And we have evidence of of um, Lu George Lucas pulling from uh, other mystical systems. So he didn't just like create something out of thin air. He, he did what the Masons did and just pull all these things together to create uh, an interesting system of initiation mm -hmm. that uh, describes how can one live differently after being transformed awesome so i have to start with a book that we referenced last night on the show this is approaching the middle chamber hell yeah Severn liberal arts and freemasonry in the western esoteric tradition by good friend and brother jamie paul lamb who is speaking uh, at esotericon yep who is who is doing a practical workshop at esotericon mm -hmm. so Got my signed copy right here. Um, for someone who wants to truly blend the Western esoteric tradition with the teachings of Freemasonry, this is this is the book. Um, now, I, I will say it would be beneficial perhaps for 
those who read the book to have already gone through the degrees. Um, but it dives off into the deep end, you know, after you have gone through those degrees. Um, the next book is the single biggest influence in my life on my own personal spiritual path. Um, it is The Wisdom Jesus, uh, Transforming Heart and Mind, A New Perspective on Christ and His Message by Cynthia Bourgeau. Um, and this book is the reason why I am on this show today. Uh, it enabled me to finally break away from the religion I was brought up in and forge my my own path of of love and life um and then finally um a book i recommend to just about anybody who is a mason is a book by bob davis called the mason's words it is a history of the masonic ritual and bob davis out of oklahoma past grand master um phenomenal book now it's it's heavy historical so you're not going to be you know you're not going to be diving into a lot of occult philosophy but where bob davis excels is putting the broader context around the words of masonry and why the words were the way they were at a particular point in time and so if you want to really understand the foundational underpinning, you know, external influences on the formation and evolution of Freemasonry as an organization and a, you know, a, a you know, a path of initiation, then the Mason's words is one of the best books to, to get that context. And then if you want to learn more about meditation, the cloud of unknowing. Yes. Beautiful. I thank you, brothers, for sharing uh, that. I could tell that there was a little uh, something special behind each one of those to you guys, and I, I can really appreciate that. Um, so I want to give you just an opportunity to plug any, I don't know, upcoming events, episodes, or things that you guys are, are working on. Uh, I know we talked about Esotericon. Is there anything else you guys want to mention? Thursdays, 9.30 Eastern, the Masonic Roundtable. You can find us on Facebook and YouTube. We stream live to both every Thursday night. Uh, we've done over 430 episodes. That's I think impressive. Like 438, something like that, wow. over the course of 10 years. Um, it is a conversation about Freemasonry and initiation and spooky stuff among best friends and we invite you our listener to come in and be our best friend for that hour that we talk and yeah. so it's beautiful yeah. one of my favorite things about not just the podcast but our conversation today is how much you guys really embody the spirit of of fraternity i mean there's there's a lot of love Nice. There's a fair amount of annoyance and hatred too, uh, but that comes with it. That's, that's yeah, the we, fraternity. Yeah, we fucking hate each other sometimes, but it's surrounded by an umbrella of yep. brotherly love and affection. We yeah, have a word on the show because Joe was telling me he hated me too much, <laughs> and it made one of our listeners feel bad. And <laughs> so, whenever we we get really upset at each other, you know, we we say "as you wish" from the Princess Bride, and um, because it, it's. You know, we're saying as you wish as a placeholder for I love you, brother. <laughs> yeah. It's I I I I will sometimes conclude um talks or, or addresses about the topic to to lodges. Uh you know, we're always brothers, but uh it's also labor. <laughs> <laughs> <You know? laughs> nice. It's it's definitely labor. But uh I appreciate you guys um 
I'll give you an opportunity for any last thoughts. Uh, if you have any, uh, Brother John, Brother Joe. Um, otherwise, uh, we'll cap it here. No, all I want to say is uh, I am so happy to finally meet you face to face. Likewise. Look forward to seeing you in person one day in the future. Um, and uh, yeah, this is you've been doing fantastic job, Brother Ike. Um, you put an amazing thing together, and I, I think I can speak for all of us that we're, we're so blessed to be a part of it. Sorry, it's feeding time here. My dogs are getting shitty. Oh, um, I get it. Yeah, this is a blast, man. Look forward to continuing the conversation. Yeah, thank thank you. you so much. This was great. Thanks, Brother Ike. I want to take a moment uh, to address everyone watching or listening to this right now to say a few brief words about the Southeastern Masonic Symposium that I'm organizing uh, in collaboration with the Asheville Masonic Temple and Mount Hermon Lodge 118 in Asheville, North Carolina this year. This event is now open for registration to Masons and non-Masons, both in person and if you cannot travel, online. Um, it's taking place June 8th and 9th at the Asheville Masonic Temple at 80 Broadway in Asheville, North Carolina. I've included a QR code in the video graphic as well as a link in the About section of this video to the Preview and Registration page. Uh, we're going to have some top Masonic speakers from across the state and country delivering talks and presentations on subjects like Masonic astrology, archetypal temple building, the history of symbolism in the Western esoteric traditions, the esoteric nature of initiation, the Emerald Tablet of Hermes Trismegistus, and more, including a keynote address by most worshipful past Grand Master, Brother Sean Bradshaw. Our non-Masonic track will feature presentations on the nature of Freemasonry, both esoteric and mundane, with an Ask a Mason panel Q&A to follow. Situated in the heart of bustling and highly walkable downtown Asheville, the Asheville Masonic Temple is an elegant, beautiful, and historic city landmark and one of the most sought-after venues in the region. In-person attendees will have full access, and there'll be plenty of social time in our several lounges, as well as historic building tours, which are sure to transport you to the golden age of Masonic history. But more than that, it's a living temple of masonry with several active and vibrant lodges that do work there and meet regularly. This is the place to meet masons and practitioners in the broader field of the Western esoteric traditions. Sit down, have a meal, drink tea, uh, drink some wine or beer, ask questions. Again, digital participants will also be able to ask questions during the Q&A sections of the online presentations via a moderator, as well as during the panel Q&A. For more information, please scan the QR code on the screen or visit the link to the Southeastern Masonic Symposium below.